so today we have uh, a very full program, very interesting one. The first talk will be given by was it, uh, Jim Hatt, uh, Brown University. Um, he's a, an old timer of, you know, of learn exploration, so we are very happy to have him. You know, he you know, has all the wisdom and experiences. And his talk will be followed by Professor Nori Namiki, uh, NAOJ. Uh, and he will also be giving us some uh, exciting uh, new, new information on Japanese pine in, uh, in the Artemis project. Um, and uh, and uh, in the morning, we have the, the another talk, uh, the final talk will be given by uh, Dr. Nassim uh, Morris, uh, who has just arrived, at, I think, at the Rice University from, from, uh, from Berlin, from there on. And he'll be talking about the you know, firm evolution of the Hernan Magma Ocean. And uh, in the afternoon, uh, starting from two o'clock, we will have uh, Professor Alexander Vasilevsky uh, speaking from Moscow and on the uh, on the important problems, you know, uh, to be solved uh, for the science, in particular for geology. Um, and uh, the, his talk will be followed by. Professor Kai Wunderman uh, from uh, at the Museum for, for Nat uh, Natural Music, uh, History uh, in Berlin. Uh, um, and the final talk today will be given by, by uh, Dr. Sebastian uh, Charles uh, from, uh, in Paris. And his title will be on the origin of the moon. Uh, the, the time is up now uh, for Professor uh, Jim has talk. Um, thank you very much. Wing, it's just a real pleasure to be here to be uh, the warm-up act, if you will, for Nori, uh, Maxime, Sasha, Kai, and Sebastian. Um, this is really an important thing to think about, I think. Uh, basically, I want to talk to you about the rewards of science and engineering synergism and take you back to the time before the Apollo missions. What, what did we know about the moon and how did we learn all this about the moon from the Apollo program? And I want to illustrate this by my personal experiences working very closely <clears throat> with the engineers uh, and the operations people uh, in Apollo to make basically our scientific dreams uh, a reality. So let me start by pointing out that, uh, in fact, we've all seen, uh, of course, the historic pages of the New York Times and astronauts Buzz Aldrin on the moon and the footprints, et cetera. And we're in the middle of the 50th anniversary of Apollo, basically, between Apollo 13 and Apollo 14, actually. And I participated in all of these. It was a very exciting time. And I'll mention things about that in a couple of minutes here. But um, I want to use this context as we've done with the 50th anniversary to talk about not so much the past, but how we learn from the past to actually go forward to the moon and on to Mars uh, together. So let me point out that uh, the United States, of course, does have plans, the Artemis program. And in phase one, um, there is still a schedule to go and land on the surface by 2024 and lots of activities in between with the commercial payload, lunar payload services, robotic missions to the moon, et cetera. So we're really excited about this and whether we land by the goal of 2024 or a couple of years later, I think uh, space is such a bipartisan activity in the United States that uh, regardless of all the consternation that's going on at the present time, I think uh, things will settle down really, very soon and I think the consensus will be to continue the program. So we're excited about that. So it's really important for this and the Chinese, of course, are. Um, uh, planning to send humans uh, to um, the surface of the moon, particularly in the South Polar region. And I'm sure that, you know, the robotic exploration program has been excellent uh, with, uh, with the Chang'e 5, uh, very successful sample return mission. <clears throat> so we, we see lots of activities there leading to human exploration, ESA, uh, India, um, uh, Japan, other countries will participate in all this. So it's worth it to think about what did we learn from the Apollo Lunar Exploration Program that might help guide all of our future planning for uh, uh, human and robotic exploration. So let's go back to the moon pre-1959. What do we know at that time? This is pre-1959, okay, and what did we not know? Well, we didn't know the origin. Uh, we didn't know the age of the moon. We didn't know whether it formed hot or cold. We didn't know the nature of the surface, really, uh, the Mari and the Terra. Uh, we didn't know the age of the surface or the origin of the craters. Lots of debates about whether all these holes in the ground were volcanic or, God forbid, impact. Can you imagine that? And basically, the other thing we didn't know was, what does the other half of the moon look like? We didn't know what the far side of the moon looked like. 
So this was kind of <laughs> uh, limited knowledge, if you will. And yet uh, in the Apollo program, um, we learned a lot as we did in the lunar program. So the Soviet lunar missions, beautiful, beautiful missions, beautiful engineering associated with the landers, the lunacot, the lunar sample return, uh, lunar orbiters, and the Zon human rated missions as well. So uh, the Russians in this situation, the Soviet Union was really uh, leading the way, absolutely, as it, as it continues to do in many cases, including going back to the moon with humans. And uh, basically in Apollo, the Apollo program uh, began with John Kennedy's speech, the famous speech in 1961, which set the audacious and amazing goal to send humans to the moon and return them safely by the end of the decade, that's nine years. Um, that, that just like electrified people. I mean, it was a combination of like, is he kidding? And uh, wow, I wonder if we can do that. And from my own personal point of view, I was in graduate school at Brown University in uh, the late 1960s. And I was working on, you can see in the upper left there, shallow marine carbonate environments in the early Devonian Appalachians. Not much to do with the moon. Um, that was my PhD thesis. But I was looking for a job in the 19, late 1960s. And I turned to what was called, it's a book of jobs, basically, a college placement annual. And I looked at page, I looked up geologists and it had page 15 to 21. Then it had page 72. I thought, wow, what's that outlier? What's on page 72? I opened to page 72 and I saw this picture of the moon and it said, our job is to think our way to the moon and back. And I thought, how do you do that? And it had in the bottom right hand corner, call this number, <laughs> telephone number. And I, you know, how could I not call that number? Uh, what an incredible idea. Think your way to the moon and back. And so I actually called that number and I got the job. I got the job. Uh, and my first job uh, indeed was uh, to work at NASA headquarters. I was a systems engineer. Uh, I never had a course in engineering. I didn't even know what systems engineering was, but for five years, I worked as a systems engineer. We developed a scientific exploration strategy. Uh, we worked on landing site section. Well, now that we have a strategy, uh, where do we go to answer these questions? And then Travers planning, what do we do when we get there? <laughs> and then how do we work with the engineers uh, to implement the science goals and objectives? Really critical, okay, We're, we have a great ideas, but how do we get them to become reality? Um, so we began quickly to work with the engineers and that's where the science and engineering synergism developed. I worked years on astronaut training. How do we train test pilots to be geologists? They're all incredibly bright people and they were really pleasures to have as students. Mission simulations, how do we practice? Mission operations, what do we do during the actual missions? Well, that, that, was, that was one of the most exciting things, of course, because the astronauts on the moon were on the moon. Uh, we watched them leave Cape Kennedy during the launch, work with them in the last few days before they left for the moon and then raced to Houston to be in mission control when they got there. And then when they came back, we worked on post-mission debriefing and analysis to get the feedback into the next mission. And you'll see as we go along that these missions were happening at a very rapid pace. So I might be working on a, re on a mission, a real-time mission like Apollo 12, and at the same time working with the Apollo 13 and 14 crew in training, uh, flying to some place on the earth to work with them in training, and then we were designing traverses and selecting sites. Uh, it was an incredible uh, experience. And of course, we planned subsequent missions. Every time we learned something, we factored that into the next mission, which might be happening three to four months later. So that was my job. And what did we not know? Well, we didn't, we didn't really understand much of anything at this point. It was pretty scary when I look back on it, but we, we knew no fear because nobody had ever done it before and we were gonna try to do it. So we needed to understand the nature of the surface at high resolution the bearing strength and characteristics of the soil. We look at these, that footprint now, we know all about that, but we did not at the time. Uh, we didn't need to know the surface morphology and topography uh, for landing safety and where were the interesting geological sites. So in fact, we launched 21 robotic precursor missions in eight years before Neil Armstrong put his foot down on the moon. That's amazing, 21 missions. And you know, for all human exploration, a key lesson is robotic precursor missions are totally essential, okay? So we had a great set of spacecraft, the Saturn V, awesome, awesome. I, I just, I hope that whenever a, an equivalent is built, you all get the opportunity uh, to actually um, 
witness one of these launches. Absolutely amazing, just amazing. I mean, it, 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 in, indescribable. I watched Apollo 17 at night, unbelievable, lit up the sky. The command and service module was also really incredible. The astronauts were in here. Not only was this the service module, but the back part was the sim bay, was hollowed out, and tons of instruments were in here for orbital operations. And of course, the beautiful lunar lander, took, taking the astronauts to the surface and then bringing them back up again on, in the ascent stage when they were finished their exploration. So what were the Apollo scientific goals and objectives? Well, really, we want to understand the nature, internal structure, and history of the moon and its environment. And there were four parts to that. Surface science stations deploying experiments, the Apollo Lunar Surface Experiment Package, seismometers, magnetometers, uh, other types of uh, instruments. Surface exploration, what did the astronauts do? Um, we did a lot of things, deploying additional instruments and making measurements, etc. And then orbital exploration, what, what kinds of orbital exploration uh, did we do? One astronaut was in orbit, we got a lot of incredible observations there as well as deploying and operating the instruments. And finally, the moon was also used as a platform, I'll mention this in a minute, uh, uh, to, to actually use uh, deep space telescopes and also look for gravity waves. So one lesson here, many people don't appreciate this. They, oh, they landed at Apollo 11 and then it was, yeah, a couple of other times that was it. There was a huge range of science at all levels during Apollo. So I'm gonna use this slide and come back to it. These are all the Apollo missions that were flown, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 to th through 17. So we're gonna to go to each one of these and then take a look at the increasing science and engineering synergism that took place as we tried to learn more and more about the moon. I'm gonna use this slide here to come back to, to talk about each step of the way, what we did to increase the capabilities of Apollo. Whoops, sorry about that. Um, to increase the capabilities of Apollo, uh, as we went along. And uh, this is really interesting because you'll see each step of the way, we had new dreams and demands and the engineers, we worked shoulder to shoulder with the engineers and it was absolutely incredible. I mean, you, you know, I mean, you, you heard that story, some of my best friends are lawyers, um, but you know, we just were working on these problems completely together and I learned so much from them and hopefully they did from us as well. So we're gonna come back to this as well. Um, and um, of course, the first one of these things uh, that we needed to do was to land safely, deploy experiments, collect rocks uh, and soil and return. So this was, this was critical. It, I mean, we weren't going anywhere if we didn't first do this. So that was indeed um, Apollo 11. Okay, seven, eight and nine were precursor missions and 10. And Apollo, that was testing out various parts of the spacecraft, the lunar module, the command and service module, command module and deployment, et cetera. July 16th, Apollo 11 was launched to a landing site in the Eastern Maria, uh, one of the smoother areas on the moon. That's, that's because <laughs> we didn't want any problems. And indeed uh, it landed successfully, as you know, and uh, I think everybody's completely familiar with the Apollo 11 mission and Neil Armstrong's um, uh, First steps on the moon, followed by Buzz Aldrin, who's pictured here. So this is the lunar surface experiments package that was deployed. There's a, there's a camera system here for high resolution images, a television camera, and lots of other instruments and capabilities. And uh, indeed, this was a very successful mission, to be sure, not just from a human destination and accomplishing uh, Kennedy's goal, but indeed they did traverses. So here's the lunar module right here. And these are the uh, activities of the astronauts on the surface as they set up those instruments we were just looking at and indeed did traverses over to West Crater, Little West Crater, and then also um, collected lots of samples in these areas. And so Apollo 11, <coughs> um, the, this is the traverse and we'll come back to these for each mission. Look at this scale here. This is 50 meters, okay? And the astronauts were able to really do a lot of work here. Um, this is uh, Buzz and Neil in doing some geological training at one of our field trips in Meteor Crater, Arizona. Um, and they did a superb job, really well-trained and, and just top-notch people to start with, uh, highly dedicated and motivated. Um, indeed, the samples that were brought back, there was one period of EVA, two and a half hours, okay, which is a long time for the first mission. The total traverse was only a few hundred meters and 21 and a half kilograms of rocks and soils were brought back. And here's a blow up of some of these soils, okay? You can see dark fragments, which were the Mari basalts, dated to 3.9, 3.7 billion years old, 
uh, re really old. We didn't know whether there were 300,000 or 3 billion. There were 3.7 billion. And these white rocks in here in the soils were in fact pieces of a northosite. And John Wood, one of the scientists working on the early Apollo missions, um, wanted to look at soil where everybody wanted to look at the rocks. And he surmised, uh, you'll hear about this a little later on, um, <laughs> that in fact this represented plagioclase flotation in a magma ocean. So even from dirt on Apollo 11, we learned initially the age of the surfaces and the highlands, as well as formulating the first model that stands to today of the formation of the um, magma ocean crust of the moon. A amazing for the first mission. Well, of course, we wanted to stay longer on the moon. We wanted to increase stay time. We wanted to increase the periods of activity to two periods. Um, get a rest in between, come out again and work. And then we wanted to demonstrate pinpoint landing to increase access to different places on the moon. The problem with Apollo 11 was that basically we didn't know enough. Um, and Neil, uh, when Neil flipped over and got his first view of the surface, he saw a lot of boulders. And of course he quite rightly flew longer downrange. And we actually didn't know exactly where they were on the moon when they were on the moon, okay? We could not follow them because we didn't, had not been able to locate them because of the last minute maneuvers. And this was not conducive to people landing in a pinpoint, like at exact point. So Bob Gilruth, the head of the Johnson Space Center at the time, got the idea of uh, taking a scientific site and maybe landing at the Surveyor 3 landing site that had landed a couple of years before. If you give the engineers a goal like this to land at a specific point, and we can show that we can do that, then we can go anywhere on the moon we want. And this was not a trivial task. And indeed, um, that was the goal. So Apollo 12 landed in the Western Moria. It was launched on November 14th, just a few months after Apollo 11. And you can see here the Western Moria, uh, and you can see here, this is uh, Alan Bean getting out, the uh, lunar module pilot, uh, of the lunar module at the Apollo site. And here is Pete Conrad actually taking some uh, inspection of the Surveyor 3. And in the background, you can see uh, the lunar module. So they not only landed uh, nearby and not too close, okay, um, because you didn't want to land on it, uh, but in fact, it proved pinpoint landing. They were able to do a series of traverses. You can see here the traverses and increase the capability uh, to go to a whole series of areas here that we had pre-planned traverses to try to sample these different craters to get to different depths in the in the Maria. And uh, they did a superb job, a superb job. In fact, uh, they not only collected uh, uh, Mari basalt samples, 3.2 billion years old, much younger than the Apollo 11 ones, but they got samples of things that turned out to give us hints about creep volcanism and other types of activity uh, in the earlier history of the moon. So on Apollo 12, two EVAs, seven hours and 45 minutes, and the total traverse is about three kilometers as opposed to a few hundred meters. This is just walking, okay? They collected 34 and a half about kilograms of rocks and soils, a lot more than Apollo 11. Um, and this is great because it really helps to bring the rocks back, that's for sure. Um, in addition, the next thing we really wanted to do was to provide equipment for transport and tool of tools and samples. And so, you know, the idea was that the Apollo 11 and 12 astronauts, they had a little, uh, uh, a little um, carrying cart, if you will, a little hand, uh, uh, like a little suitcase they pick up and they had the tools in there and they could put the samples in this and, and bring them back and with some bags and things. But, but really walking over three kilometers and, um, you know, essentially carrying all that stuff was, uh, was uh, really uh, not the best way to do it. And so they said on the way back, look, let's, let's, let's talk about um, getting kind of like a little wheelbarrow or some kind of little cart you can pull behind you. And so believe it or not, within the time uh, between the missions and, and a little bit before, um, the idea was gotten together for a mobile equipment transporter. And that was indeed put on the next mission. So that would assist the astronauts uh, and carrying all their equipment, picking up even more rocks from these distance things and enabling them to pull them back. So the next mission was the Apollo 13 mission. Uh, it landed, it launched a few months later, uh, of course, and it was targeted to the Framar formation. So this was one of those rough areas that no one would have been able to land at had it not been um, uh, pinpoint landing from Apollo 12 experience uh, capability had that not been shown. So 
It was to the embryon basin ejecta, the Framor formation is radial texture from the embryon basin ejecta. And of course, we wanted to know everything we could about how that ejecta was in place, the age of the basin and so on. And of course, you know, <laughs> sadly, Apollo 13, you, you're all familiar with that. Like uh, Houston, we got a problem. And indeed they did on the way to the moon, uh, the uh, uh, oxygen tanks, tanks in the rear um, part of the service module uh, blew up and created a huge problem. And we were fortunate to be able to get them back safely. Now Apollo 14, after uh, you know, a lot of uh, study and, and uh, corrections of the service module and the whole system in the Apollo command and service module, um, just uh, a few months later, actually, uh, Apollo 14 was launched to the same site. Uh, it was really critical to be able to go there. We demonstrated pinpoint landing. And then nine months later, uh, we were able to launch to um, the Framora Formation. And here, uh, Al Shepard and uh, Ed Mitchell landed on the Apollo 14 landing site. And you can see how rough it is here. Look at these hills and swales here, together with all the craters. And uh, this was an incredibly important site. And you can see here, here are the tracks of the mobile equipment transporter. And here's a picture of it here. It's quite, a, it's quite an interesting thing. You basically, it's got wheels and you pick it up and pull it along and you can carry all this stuff with you and put the rocks in there and essentially explore, um, uh, uh, deploy the instruments like the lunar laser, laser ranging retroflector and also do uh, cores and other types of things uh, and, and much more easily. So the mobile equipment transporter was a real good science and engineering synergism development. And uh, on Apollo 14, there were two EVAs, uh, almost nine and a half hours. Um, total traverse was now three to four kilometers. This is walking, mind you, assisted by this uh, pull cart here, if you will. And they got almost 43 kilograms of rocks and soils uh, from the, Apollo, the, the Framor Formation, an incredible treasure trove of understanding of highland breaches and, and placement of ejecta, including ancient Mari deposits and other types of things. You can see here the Traverse, the landing site, and the Traverses here, uh, to Cone Crater. Um, in addition, just one example here. Recently, uh, one of these rocks from the Apollo 14 mission has been examined in one of the felsite class, a very specific mineralogy that's unusual for the moon, has been examined. And it's thought that this might actually be a um, piece of the earth that was thrown off by an impact and landed on the moon. People are debating that hypothesis, but this is, you know, 50 years later and these rocks are still giving us an incredible amount of information. So amazing. And the science and engineering synergism really helped in that because the astronauts were not concerned about overloading themselves with rocks. They could put them on the mobile equipment transporter and bring them back easily uh, to, uh, to the lunar module. So of course, we wanted to go elsewhere on the moon. <laughs> Uh, we wanted to be able to go to high alt high latitudes, okay, and high altitudes, but mostly high latitudes. Uh, we wanted to increase the number of EVA periods to three. We always wanted more, okay, and we wanted to provide even more mobility so that we could really get to distant targets. So we had been talking to the engineers initially about, well, how do we, can we get a car? You know what I mean? We really like a car to go on the moon. And, you know, so are you crazy? Where are we going to put it? How are we going to get it there? So, da, da. Well, you know, they, they rose to the challenge. And they indeed, uh, uh, Ron Creel at, at, uh, at uh, Marshall Space Flight Center and many of his colleagues, et cetera, engineers uh, worked to get this lunar rover together. And it, they did. And on Apollo 15, 16, and 17, we had a car on the moon. Okay. Uh, so we were enabling this orbital plane change, which is not trivial either. Let me point out what that means. If you are in an orbit around the moon in the equator, you can come back to the earth very easily. You just burn to get out of orbit. On the other hand, if you uh, are in an elliptical orbit, or sorry, inclined to the plane of the ecliptic, um, uh, to, to the plane of the equator, then you have to do a series of maneuvers to get from um, the uh, surface to rendezvous again with the uh, command module, which is in orbit. And this is not trivial. It's not trivial at all. It requires a lot of navigation. So this was one constraint that got relaxed. We were able to do a plane change. So we're in equatorial orbit. You do a plane change and get into this inclined orbit. And uh, indeed, 
we, this enabled us to go to high latitude sites like the Apollo 15 and Apollo 17 site, et cetera, and Apollo 16 site. So uh, indeed, this was really important. So we wanted to go to the Hadley Apennine region. We'd been down here to the Fra Mara formation, but what was the edge of the basin look like? We wanted to land right in the middle at the base of the mountains here to collect rocks from the, from the basin and also to look at the Mari there and the sinuous rill, which I'll point out in a second. So just six months later, we launched indeed on July 26, 1971 uh, to um, the uh, uh, Hadley Apennine region of the moon. Dave Scott and Jim Irwin uh, went down to the surface and Al Warden stayed in orbit in the command module. The other thing we needed was to do, if we wanted to land at this spot, we had to, <laughs> we had to fly over, not we, Dave Scott and Jim Irwin had to fly over a 14,000 foot high mountain, Mount Hadley, and then descend rapidly to stay on this side of a 900 meter deep sinuous rill that you can see here. It looks like a river, but it was carved by lava. You know, they needed the land right here, not over here, but here to get access to all of this. So this required Dave Scott, the commander of the mission, to go into um, the simulator many, many times to see if he could do a steep descent to get to that point. This required cooperation of the engineers, the operational people, as well as the astronauts who had to make a commitment to do this unusual thing in the name of science. And they did, and they did it. As you can see here, uh, in fact, there they are on the surface. They've just flown over that mountain and Dave Scott and Jeremy Irwin uh, landed successfully. Uh, so this was a very exciting mission. <clears throat> and you can see here that indeed the lunar car uh, did in fact uh, become reality. <laughs> uh, and indeed, it, it, I, I wish I had uh, time to show you the movie of deployment of this thing. Uh, it's just unbelievable. This thing was folded up and put in the side of the lunar module. Okay, let me see if I can, um, basically there's where it came out of, okay. It came out of this part of the, uh, of the lunar module. It was folded up and put in there and then they opened this and deployed it. And there it is, okay. It, it, the wheels pop out, the structure pops out and uh, it's just an amazing engineering feat. And they did that because we wanted them to so we could get to uh, ever increasing distances. So. Um, there it is, and here's Dave Scott. This is one of my favorite pictures. This is Dave Scott, all suited up with his camera. The geological maps you can see here, uh, stowed on the surface here uh, for traverse, uh, traverses and geology, and all the, and he's anxiously awaiting for Jim Irwin to take the picture and get on. We got work to do here, okay? And here's the tools in the background that they were able to use. This is the soil mechanic experiment, et cetera. So this was utilized too, to help carry rocks and soils uh, across the surface. And they did an amazing job. One stand-up EVA where Dave depressurized, stood up in the top of the lunar module, looked around because we landed in 20 meter resolution image data. This was another thing. Can you imagine convincing an engineer that you want to land a spacecraft that in fact, you don't know the topography better than 20 meters? Well, um, we didn't because uh, we didn't have any better data, but we built up such a sense of accomplishment and ability uh, so far that we were pretty sure the Mari wasn't going to have unusual problems associated with it. And so we were, the operations people, the engineers and the astronauts said, yeah, we can do that. And so we did it. So three EVAs, seven kilometer radius, seven kilometer radius and a total traverse distance of over 30 kilometers. Okay. 77 kilograms of rocks and soils. Uh, they did a superb job. Here they are at Hadley Rill. Here they are on the side of uh, Hadley Delta Mountain. That's Dave Scott. This is the rover about ready to slide down a hill. And you can see they got lots of really interesting rocks, including a variety of ones, one called the Genesis Rock. You can see it here. So we knew that the impact of the Embryon Basin was going to bring up rocks from great depth. And so we uh, work with the astronauts to talk about what you want to look for specifically is very coarse grain, white, plagioclase rich rocks. Um, and because those will be the ones that cool slowly, deep within the crust, and were thrown out onto the surface of the moon. So Dave Scott, <laughs> you, you should listen to the uh, transcripts of these things. It, it's beautiful to hear the excitement in their voices as they're exploring. Dave Scott says, whoa, Houston, I think we found what we came for. 
he, from about five meters away, recognized this little rock sitting up on this pedestal. And as he said when he got back, it was just there waiting for me, waiting for me. And he could spot in here plagioclase 20. This is a property of plagioclase that makes it shine in one direction. And he spotted those, um, those uh, signals, if you will, of the light shining off this and said he knew that was felspar, he knew that was plagioclase, and he knew there was so much of it that it had to be that deep rock. And so again, his training really paid off. Very smart guy. And here he is looking at it uh, after it came back uh, to the earth. Dave also discovered green glass. The excitement in his voice then was, was incredible. Houston, it's green, it's green glass. And again, some 40 years later, in 2011, uh, Alberto Saul at, at Brown in our labs um, found water in the lunar glass with the new capabilities. And that's revolutionized our thinking about the moon as well. So even samples collected 40 or 50 years ago are still returning a huge amount of information. Apollo 15, the ability to get around on the surface was essential. And so you can see here that they were able to get to rocks and we could see, um, get 500 meter, millimeter images for the camera of the far wall with all this, the layering in there. That was really important. Um, and get a whole host of samples of these uh, basalts here. In addition, we had talked a lot about gas and magma. It's really important to know, was the moon dry? Uh, was it wet? Did it have, what kind of volatiles, what kind of gas did it have in it? Dave was really interested in that. And, you know, on the way back from, I think it was EVA2, um, Houston is kind of looking at the oxygen levels and so on and says, you know, Apollo 15, time to return to the lunar module, get back as soon as you can. And they said, yep, we're on, we're suited up, we're ready to go, we're on the rover, we're on our way back. Driving across the surface on the way back to the lunar module, Dave spots this rock, which he described to me later as being, oh my God, it was just crystal clear and it had all kinds of vesicles in it and I just had to have it so we could see what those gases were all about. And so he says, um, Houston, um, I think we've got a problem with a seatbelt here. I'm going to stop and, um, and, and check on my seatbelt. Oh, yeah, we don't want you falling off. Yeah, yeah, but hurry up. Okay, so Dave stops the rover, gets off, picks up this rock, fully documents it, um, and then gets back on the rover and says, Houston, yeah, we're all, we're all fixed. It's good. Okay, get back, get back to the lunar module. And that's another example. I mean, you know, he really knew what we were trying to do here and was a major part of it. He was the explorer the commander that made that call. So again, science, engineering, operations, and astronaut synergy. Apollo 16, again, we wanted to go to a place we'd never been before, to the highlands, to look for ancient volcanism. Uh, in the Mari, it was thought that, in the non-Mari areas, it was thought that these smooth plains up here were, uh, were possibly lunar volcanism. And so that was the goal of the mission, was to learn about how this volcanic activity occurred. And so uh, only nine months later, Apollo 16, 1972 and April 16th launched to the Cayley Formation in the Descartes region. Um, Commander John Young and Lunar Module Pilot Charlie Duke and Ken Mattingly stayed in orbit. And you can, <laughs> as soon as they landed, John Young said, uh, Houston, um, you know, I think we got a little bit of a problem here. These things aren't, uh, these aren't basalts. These are impact breaches. They're just impact breaches. And sure enough, no basalts were found there. They were all impact breaches. And I, I had to tell a quick little story. Um, you know, the, we used to be able to go into mission control um, when the astronauts were on the way back to the moon and we could talk to them a little bit. Um, and the, the flight director would kind of give us the okay and hand us the mic. It was really exciting to do that. And so we're talking to Johnny and he says, um, I said, Johnny, what, what did you, there's really, the, the breaches sound incredible. He says, yeah, you geologists are going to have to go back to the drawing boards or wherever it is you go. And he was being very sarcastic. And, you know, we, we got it wrong, basically. But we learned, and that was the whole point. You don't go to prove what you know. You go to explore the unknown. And, again, they did a superb job of sampling all these breaches. And, again, I want to mention, too, that on this mission, there was an astronomy from the moon with a far ultraviolet camera and spectrograph. Uh, George Carruthers of Naval Research Lab built this thing and operated it. And here's John Young jumping about a meter off the ground here. And you can see George Carruthers instrument in the shadow of the lunar module here. Lots of really important things. And future astronomy from the moon is gonna be absolutely incredible. So Apollo 16, 
three EVAs, 27 kilometers, and return almost 100 kilograms of rocks and soils. You can see here uh, the scale, two kilometers, and you can look at this, incredible, okay? So this was really important as well and got tremendous amount of information. So one of the things we wanted to do was to send, although the astronauts were doing a superb job, we wanted to send a geologist as a member of the surface crew. This was you know, really important. Geologists had trained um, Harrison Schmidt, Jack Schmidt, known, to, known as Jack to all of us, um, was a superb geologist and a good astronaut. And so we wanted to fly an astronaut on one of these missions. And so we took advantage of the rover capability, the astronaut capability and all the instruments. And on Apollo 17 and December 7th, 1972, the last of the Apollo missions, only eight months after Apollo 16, this was sent to the Serenitatis Basin. How old is it? What was the dark mantling deposit there? Could it represent young volcanism? Really, you know, kind of the alpha and omega. We knew these basins were ancient, but what was this dark stuff, this, this apparently pyroclastic glass uh, deposit that was uh, superposed on everything. Could that be, in fact, active volcanism today? Because we didn't see very many craters on it at all. So this mission, again, landed here, uh, okay, again, out of the equatorial zone. And you can see here the view coming down into the Taurus Lictro Valley. It's going to spacecraft the lunar module will land about right here at the edge of the Serenitatis Basin. Um, again, Gene Cernan was the commander, great guy, really sharp, really sharp guy. And, G and uh, Jack Schmidt was a lunar module pilot. They had a rover. Uh, they drove across the surface between these two mountains and collected a lot of rocks. <laughs> and they explored these huge rocks. Look at the size of this relative to Jack. Um, and again, deployed a whole series of really complex experiments, really fantastic sets of experiments, uh, each of which provided important information about the moon. Here's the lunar rover next to these huge blocks that had rolled down a hill. Uh, and Jack, as a professional geologist, was really able to piece together the context of the samples he was taking in this large block. And again, at some point, you know, Gene and Jack discovered, uh, we saw this, this dark halo crater. They went over and looked at it, one of the stops, and they found it was formed of orange glass. We were so excited in mission control because we thought maybe this meant that um, orange glass usually oftentimes means gas activity, fumaroles, for example, which commonly means of really recent volcanism. So, oh my gosh, could this be volcanism today? And of course, uh, they were able to sample it uh, and they were able to see, in fact, um, the details of this. And it, it turned out to be not young, okay, but 3.7 billion years old. Uh, the reason it was so under cratered was because craters were just not showing up in the dark mantle because of the properties of the mantle, et cetera. So this was a major discovery and it was an explosive eruption on the moon, um, which we're still studying today, absolutely amazing. Apollo 17, look at the traverses here. Again, there's the two kilometer scale. And you can see, look at the distance here, okay? Three EVAs, about 35 kilometers, okay? Return 111 kilograms of rocks and soils. So this, this is just amazing from the North Mountains to the South Mountains and all in between. And I, I, I wanna point out just a, a, another example of good science and engineering synergism here. Um, during the course of the mission, uh, one of the astronauts, I won't mention who, um, uh, rubbed against the edge of the back tire and broke off a piece of the um, fender, okay, which kept the lunar dust from coming up back onto the spacecraft, uh, onto the rover. And so, so uh, basically they had to do a repair. So clearly science and engineering synergism came through because the engineer says, okay, get the duct tape, duct tape it. And you can see here, they took the geological maps that they'd finished with, and they taped them to the back of the fender. And that worked as a way to keep the dust from coming up on them as they were driving around. So again, good cooperation there, uh, good use of the geological maps once that EVA was over. So finally, Apollo 17 was the last mission. They kept getting canceled. The Vietnam War was raging. Money was being siphoned off in that direction in huge amounts. And so interest in Apollo was waning. And unfortunately, um, Apollo uh, 18 and 19 were canceled. And we even had plans for 2021 and 22. Um, and what were those plans about? What would have happened if Apollo had continued? 
we wanted to send the roving vehicle to the next landing site, okay? This was the dual mode rover. It looked like this, and I, I spent actually a lot of time working on these types of missions, 19, 20, and 21. Basically, the rover would be um, uh, connected to another portion that they would bring to the moon with them in the lunar module. And this would be a robotic spacecraft, uh, sorry, a robotic rover. Um, it, it's the regular rover, but it's reconfigured at the end of their stay on the moon to then be robotic and be controlled by Houston. And it would drive off into uh, the uh, area and explore the area between this landing site and the next one. And that could be hundreds of kilometers, many hundreds of kilometers. But the idea was to interpolate between sites with these series of scientific instruments, et cetera. And indeed, um, we had a lot of traverses and a lot of engineering ideas about how to do this. Unfortunately, those ideas weren't, um, uh, did not come to fruition, but they can uh, in the future. So I hope you can see from this how we were able to enhance um, science exploration return from really, really working shoulder to shoulder with the engineers. We could have indeed, without that science and engineering synergism and without the engineers wanting to do really important things in Apollo exploration, scientific exploration, we could have just had Apollo 11, maybe nine or 10 times. Um, it, it would have been productive if we'd been able to go to different places, but it's possible without the engineers really having an effect on things. Uh, and the operations people being so interested in optimizing the science, uh, we may never have gotten out of the Lunar Maria because that's the safest place to land. So all of the people, including the director of Johnson Space Center, we need pinpoint landing, gonna land next to that Surveyor 3 spacecraft. Um, you know, this was really, really um, the way that we learned. And what did we learn? Um, well, what is the legacy of Apollo? Clearly we had six really productive scientific missions. And again, you know, what this has provided, uh, which we'll hear much more about in the next few lectures, is in fact fundamental insight into the missing years of Earth history. If we look at the history of the Earth, um, starting at the beginning, um, essentially the origin of the moon here, and if you think of this as a clock, and working around indeed to today, then when we look at the Earth, okay, um, you know, uh, this clock, if you will, um, is for the Earth, is missing a significant amount of the geological history of the planet. So what we're looking at here is the percentage of the surface area of the planet that dates from this different time period. So if we think about the Earth, the ocean basins, the floors of the oceans are all less than 200 million years, that's 60% of the surface, and the continents they have the record of the rest of it, and there's very little from the first half of solar system history. So we're really lacking in understanding of our formative years. The moon has given us that record. What was going on in these formative years? Lots of impact cratering, lots of basin formation. In fact, a key finding from Apollo that many people will talk about in the later lectures is that <laughs> basically we learned that in fact, the moon may have formed from an impact of a Mars-sized object into very early Earth. So we've learned a lot about this, a lot about our formative years. Not only that, but we also use the moon now as a cornerstone for understanding the rest of the terrestrial planets. Uh, basically, much of our information and inferences and interpretations about Venus, about Mars, about Mercury come from, indeed, our understanding of how the moon works. And finally, we really look at the evolution of exploration scientific return. This is again back to the science and engineering synergism. This map shows you the increase in distance, each one of these circles is an increase in radius of one kilometer. Starting with Apollo 11, which is not visible at this scale and looking at the traverses uh, as we increase with Apollo, okay? So you can see here that <laughs> basically we, we got out to 14 or so kilometers. Now, to be fair, and Sasha would remind me of this, uh, and we'll talk about this a little later, is that Ludicod with the robotic rovers got out way far, okay, and um, they did amazing, amazing work. But the human exploration missions uh, really, really did increase as a function of time, and most of the capability came from science and engineering synergism. So here you can see the increase in distance, um, Apollo 11 through 17, 
And again, f less than five kilometers for the first three mission, and again, up to 35 kilometers for the J missions, okay, for the 15, 16, and 17. And again, the sample mass, less than 50 kilograms for the first three missions, and over 100 kilograms uh, by the time we got to Apollo 17. So again, the rewards of science and engineering synergism should be clear. It, we just, starting with not even knowing what the far side of the moon looked like, you'll hear later on what we know, and largely that's due to this science and engineering synergizing synergism, optimizing the return. So let me close with a couple of thoughts about kind of lessons for human and robotic, actually, uh, lunar and planetary exploration. These are things that are trivial to most people, but I want to repeat them together because they form kind of like a little, I would say, set of guidelines, if you will, uh, as we go forward, plan human exploration of the moon to return to the moon. I hate the term return to the moon, to go onto them. I'd like to say we're going forward to the moon and onto Mars, um, basically. So what is science? You know, people spend a lot of time arguing about this, but it's very simple to me. Science is simply exploration of the unknown. And that's what we're doing in Apollo. That's what we're doing in any robotic and human mission to another planetary body. So exploration of the unknown. We don't know any of this. And you can see from the Apollo legacy how important it is. Again, Apollo. Lots of people, oh, Apollo 11, that's it. No, it was the Apollo Lunar Exploration Program. You can see the increase in capability. And in the next several lectures, you'll hear what those rewards were all about. Oh my gosh, what we learned, absolutely incredible. Now, as we go forward, um, I think, you know, I don't want to be seen as somebody who says, well, if you do it like we did it, you'll get it right. You know, I like the, the term, uh, the, the quote, what's past is prologue. And history doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes. So you don't want to repeat everything we did um, in the same way we did it. Obviously, there's new capabilities, new technology, and so on, but you don't want to ignore it. You want to take the lessons for success and really factor them into what we're doing today, tomorrow, and beyond. And also, a, a warning here, too, is that, you know, we haven't done really good human exploration um, since Apollo. And the reason for that is we're in low Earth orbit in the International Space Station uh, at the present time, and we've had other operations in low Earth orbit <clears throat> prior to that. Um, and the problem there has been that uh, exploration has kind of like translated into operations. You're not getting out of the spacecraft, you're not finding out new things. You do find out new things, physiology, you're being studied yourself. But the key point here is you're not letting the astronauts in this kind of low Earth orbit operation, they become more operational people rather than they do uh, explorers. And I, I, I encourage you to go read a paper by Sergei Krikalev. Sergei is a Soviet and Russian uh, cosmonaut, uh, really great guy, amazing guy, one of my favorite uh, cosmonauts to be sure. Um, and and you know, he he talk, talks about in this article in Astra Astronautica, he talks about crew on the ISS, creativity or determinism. I really encourage you to read that as we go forward and, and training crews uh, to go back to the moon. And basically what he says is that uh, what I call Krikalev's law, you need to balance exploration and operations. You don't want to send astronauts to the moon and have them just do operations thing like, oh, let's set this up, let's turn these. To... No, they're explorers. They're explorers and they need to have those capabilities. So how do we do that? How do we implement Krikalev's law? Balance exploration operations? Well, you know, I think if you don't already have this culture, you need to create a culture of science and engineering synergism. The, the, the first problem is that we don't, we don't speak the same language. Scientists and engineers do not speak the same language. And yet, if we can learn each other's language, think about what we can do. Think about what we can do. Think about what Apollo did. Engineers can not just tell you, you can't do it that way. They can say, oh, that's interesting. I think I could think of a way to make your scientific dream a reality. We've really got to work closely together with the engineers because they are so smart about how to do things and how to get things done. And you know, in all modesty, I hope we're smart. We better be smart in thinking about the right things to ask them to help us do. So we need to engage and embed the scientific community uh, in, in, with the engineers and with operations. Literally, that means you know, 
get in there, listen to these people, talk to them, see how they do things. And then we need to invest in learning each other's culture and each other's language. Um, you know, systems engineering. I mean, I now know what it means, okay? It's think your way to the moon and back. And by God, even without knowing what I was supposed to be or ever having a course in engineering, it's as simple as that. Think your way to the moon and back. For lunar surface operations, we need an exploration plan. You can't just go there and set up all kinds of things, et cetera. You have to have a plan. We did that in Apollo, and I think that's another thing you can, um, you can take home uh, for the future as a lesson from Apollo. I would say, too, that one of the things you want to do is really respect the astronauts for the intellectual, scientific, bright people they are, optimize their ability to do exploration. In Apollo, we had what I call a TTT, um, strategy, okay? You train them, you trust them, and then you turn them loose. You know, because of social networking and social, you know, I mean, and, and you know, the ability to communicate, a lot of people say, well, okay, hold that rock up, and oh, no, not that one. Get another one, hold it up for me. You don't want to do that, okay? You want to train them, trust them, and turn them loose. And by the time we get to Mars, that's all you're going to have to do, because you're not going to be able to communicate with them uh, with a time lag between um, communications, 15 minutes or so depending on where you are. So, you know, train them, trust them, and turn them loose. Be there in the, in the mission control if they need you. Think about what they're doing. Plan the next traverses and talk to them when they're back in the lunar module or whatever it's going to be. And also, I think, please recognize that human and robotic exploration is a partnership, okay? Robotic exploration and human exploration, it's neither, it's not, we'll do one or the other. They really, you really need to do both. As I said, 21 robotic missions before Neil Armstrong ever set foot on the moon because we needed to know that so they could set foot on the moon and vice versa. I think a critical point here uh, to end with is engage youth and diversity. Uh, you know, we did everything we did um, with probably half the available population. I, I'm, it's sad to say, but it was the way it was at the time. Uh, women were not very well represented uh, in the Apollo program. That's 50% of the population. Um, and, and, and any other kind of diversity, new ideas would be great. And engage youth. You know, we all know, oh yeah, I know how to do this. We can do this. Look, I, I watched the Apollo 13 movie. I've seen hundreds of space movies and they're all bad, except for one, Apollo 13. If you want to know what it was like, go see that movie or get download it or whatever you do. About a week after I saw that movie, I said, I saw Jack Schmidt, the Apollo 17 lunar module pod. And I said, hey, Jack, that's the best movie I've ever seen, Apollo 13. I, didn't, didn't you think that was really like, it was, he said, yeah, it was great, but there was just one thing. And I, what, what was it? What was the problem? He said, didn't you notice that all the people in mission control in the movie were too old? They got actors that were too old. Don't you remember that the average age was 28 years in mission control? I thought, yeah, it was, wasn't it? Can you imagine yourself saying, oh, let's get a bunch of 28 year olds and turn the Apollo program over to them? I don't think so, <laughs> but you do need to do that. Youth and diversity, it's critical. And again, you know, Artemis, forward to the moon and on to Mars, and hopefully we'll all be exploring this together, all nations of the earth together. So the past is prologue, forward to the moon and on to Mars. And I'm happy to answer any questions and also obviously um, contact me by email uh, if you have any questions. I, I hope I didn't go too fast, which I usually do, uh, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Okay, Jim, thank you so much for the great talk. Uh, any questions in the audience? We have about uh, a couple of minutes actually, you know, before uh, Namiki signs up. Uh, so any advice? I mean, I think the, basically, Jim, you're, you're, you're giving us advice you know, both to the scientists and to the engineers, how they should work together, right? Uh, Sorry, I'm not hearing you. I said that you're giving us advice you know, to, the, to the engineers and also the scientists you know, that they should work together if they want to go forward. Can, they, can you hear me? Yes. I can hear you now. Yeah. yeah. The, um, Because you know, in our program, you know, uh, for for the pro, uh, for 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 the moon programs and here and there, and uh, there's always a uh, kind of gap, you know, a a, a 
a communication gap between the engineers and scientists. And I'm happy that you know you give us the, the experience from, from the Apollo mission. I think I would also add to that, that I think one of the things that uh, we did about 25 or so, 30 years ago was, um, you know, when, when around in the 1990s, when we started to lose um, uh, the necessity to go to uh, JPL, Jet Propulsion Lab, um, to get data, to work with data, et cetera, because we were getting it off through the internet and things like this, uh, students, graduate students stopped making trips to JPL. And, um, you know, so we thought about an idea, Charles Alachi and I spent a lot of time thinking about how to, <laughs> they need to be exposed to what goes on at JPL because that's, that's part of the science and engineering synergism. So we started this thing called the JPL Summer School. There was kind of a summer school, but it didn't teach people about missions. And so we did a pilot program and developed something which is now, uh, all my students take it at one point in their career. Um, and it's a, it's a mission design session at JPL. And the people who do um, the mission design, the, the mission um, operations planning and the execution of the missions are all there and they work with the students, uh, assign them different parts, different programs. Like one of my students this last time, he was in charge of cost. He didn't know anything about cost, but boy, he does now. And then they work together. And then at the end of a, a week or two, they, um, they presented their mission concept to a board. Um, that's a really good way to go. So if you have the ability to do that kind of um, training for uh, young scientists and engage the engineers in teaching that sort of thing, believe me, it's, it's like what I call a boot camp for planetary scientists and engineers. It's really, really helpful. So maybe that's one way uh, that you could, um, could help move, move into that a little bit. Uh, this is uh, Yuanhan Chang. Can I have a question? Yeah. yeah. My question is, uh, how much, um, to what extent does the engineers, do the engineers have to know the science? I mean, they have to, uh, to learn the science to, to, to sort of like an expert level or, or they just know, know what, what's the goal and, and doesn't have to know the details of how the science comes out. I think it's, it's, it's the latter. I think basically, you know, working together, well, well, I will never be an engineer and, um, you know, a number of these engineers will never be scientists and, and nobody's trying to do that. But what they do is they talk and they listen and they, um, they understand, ah, mobility. Well, how far do you think you need to go? I mean, you know, you, you know, and so we sit down with the photographs and maps and say, okay, look, uh, we'd like, wow, seven, okay, so that's going to be a problem for the suits. We can go to a radius of seven kilometers, but, you know, they don't need to know the details. It's just what are the requirements in a way. And one problem is that a lot of the times engineers will just ask for the requirements and then they'll go off and do their thing. It will get a spreadsheet and it'll give us the answer. Don't do that. Don't do that. Okay. You need a spreadsheet, but keep engaging the, the scientists because at each step of the way, you're both learning from each other. I'll just quit one quick point was that we work a lot with our uh, people in virtual reality uh, over the years and they would come to our research meetings. And of course, I have beer for my research meetings, so they would come anyway, but, um, but they would come. And, and then, you know, um, one day I said, here's what we need in, in the uh, immersive virtual reality facility. And so the next week I went over there and it was something completely different. And they said, oh, you wanted this. And I said, yeah. They said, well, that's what it means to us. And obviously the words didn't mean the same thing. Two months later, we went over to the virtual, and they said, you know, we were listening to you at your research meeting, and I think this might be a good um, capability. And my God, they had designed this thing where you could just turn your risk and it changed the stretch. And they did that from watching us, not so much learning the details of the science, but, but working with us to understand kind of what the requirements were. And then they became an enabler without us even asking in some way. So I think those are the kind of examples. Don't be intimidated by it. Start talking and start developing the communications. That's the first thing. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for the question. I, I mean, as Jim said, you're very welcome to, to ask him the same question. You know, you have his email. If you don't have his email, you can you know, copy down and write to me uh, to ask your question to him. Uh, Jim, thank you so much for this great talk. And it's always nice to hear you talk about your four days. And then uh, I, will, I will write you again. Okay, Jim? Yeah. Absolutely. 
Yeah, thank, thank, thank you very much. And uh, it's, a, it's a great program, and I look forward to more of the lectures. So I'm, thank you very much. Talk. <laughs>